Good morning, Heartland. How are we doing? Hey, so as uh, Shiv said, we've been in the series asking for a friend in which we've been saying that maybe the best thing that any single one of us can be asking for in this season is actually for a friend. That we live in a time and a place when friendships seem fewer and fewer and less frequent and harder and harder. But no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter what your gender is, no matter what your background with friends are, no matter what your personality type is, that we all need friends. That so much about the quality and the direction of our life is actually determined by the friends that we have in our life. That's what we've been talking about in the series, uh, and we will be for the next couple of weeks. And part of the fun and even thinking about this series as, as we laid this out, uh, for me, it was just thinking about all of the, the TV shows over the decades that have taught us a thing or two about friendships, or maybe have been about friendships. So I know, as, as Shib said, today we've got our meetups out in the atrium, just one of the things we do to help us make this big church feel small, get you, get you around some people that you have at least one thing in common with and have a little bit of a connection with. And uh, so just in, in thinking about all of the shows, maybe you're already thinking about some of the TV shows in your life that were all about friendships. So for all of you who are in your, your 50s plus, you go way back to the 70s. That was almost 50 years ago. That was 50 years ago. Wow. You guys are up there. So you think about some of the TV shows uh, uh, back in the 70s about friendship, and, and this is what I think of. This is actually one that I watched was Laverne and Shirley, right? I mean, look how we couldn't even find a high def graphic. That's how back we had to go uh, to get to this show. But you know, two, two girls, best friends, roommates working at the, what is it, in Milwaukee? Yeah, yeah. And in Milwaukee, you know, polar opposites in terms of personalities, but you get to watch their friendship unfold and unfold over the course of this series. Now we move into the 80s. This is more my sweet spot of TV, did a lot of TV watching, and also maybe the sweet spot of TV shows about friendships. I mean, you had the Golden Girls, right? The <laughs> no? No? But the theme, like here, let me make a case for it. The theme song is literally, thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. You're a pal and a confidant, something like that. So, may, may, okay, sorry, Golden Girls, obviously not your, not your thing. Maybe you, were, maybe you were more of the, anyone? Cheers? There we go. Much more, much more. We like shows about breweries and bars around here at Heartland. Uh, where, where everyone knows your name, Right? There you go. There you go. Now we go into the 90s. What TV show in the 90s could there possibly be that we would remember that would be about friends? Yes. Yes, there, there they are. Now, if you, um, if you happen to have parents who were a little, didn't want you watching Friends, like some of us might have had, uh, you wouldn't have watched Friends. You would have watched this great show about friendship, Saved by the Bell, Right? Yes, TV shows about friends, high school, the glory days of friendships. Now we move into the 2000s. Um, this is, I've started checking out a little bit at this time. Maybe you did a little bit too. But what I hear from those of you who are cooler and younger than me is uh, that the great TV shows about friends were Scrubs. Anyone? Can we get some? No? Maybe we're missing the mark. I got to do, have some better researchers when it comes to our our sermons. But Scrubs or maybe also The Big Bang Theory, right? Good show about friendship. Okay. There we go. We've got some Big Bang people and so many different others throughout that decade. And then we move more closely and the show that I think really epitomizes the value of friendships in our lives, obviously, is Stranger Things. <laughs> Which if, you, if you've been hesitant to jump into, all you need to know is it's, it's really just Stand By Me plus Aliens, Okay. <laughs> And so you have characters who, some characters like Steve Harrington and Dustin, who have no business being friends, becoming friends in order to save the world from monsters. Like it's, because even as it, the, the, the kind of following that this show has garnered, you wouldn't think that a show about, you know, monsters and can you even call them, I don't know what you call them, uh, would gather that much of a following. But when you make the show about friends, people are willing to watch. Because what Hollywood knows is that, is that when they need, they need a hit show, when they need to build an audience, they know that TV shows about friendships are the ticket. And it doesn't matter if these are roommates or classmates, if these are neighbors, if these are people, fellow patrons in the neighborhood bar, it doesn't matter if these are people who have 
you'd think would be friends or not. That there's something that we love about watching friends that even Hollywood knows about the value and the importance about how meaningful friendships are in our lives. That, that even when our friendships feel like they're getting harder and harder or when they're getting less meaningful or they're getting more infrequent, that we love watching other people's friendships. But what God wants us to know is that we weren't created and designed to simply watch friendships happen. That all the way back on the opening pages of scripture, we see that we were created and designed to experience friendships ourselves. And so that's why we're asking this question of how do we find friends, the kind of friends that we most need in our lives to experience those friendships. And so if you're just jumping into the series, we spent the first week and we laid out kind of a biblical foundation, some of the biblical principles about friendship. Uh, Last week, Dan talked about the first of the three kinds of friendships that we need in our lives, that one of the kinds of friendships that we need are are face-to-face friendships. These are the friendships that we can take our mask off with these people, that we can be our true selves, that we can give and experience uh, sincere love to one another, camaraderie, and and that's that's what happens when we're willing to take our mask off with one another. Next week, we're going to be talking about another kind of friendship, which is back-to-back friendships. These are those rare friendships that seem to last the stand the test of time, that they make it through the decades. And what is it about those friendships that makes that happen? That's next week as we wrap up this series. Today we're talking about another kind of friendship that we need, which are side-by-side friendships. These are the friends with the people that we can lock arms with, that, that help us through the challenges of everyday life. And as you think about what these friendships are, the Bible actually has a verse that describes side-by-side friendships. It shows up in the Old Testament in a book full of wisdom called Ecclesiastes. And the writer says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And what this verse is teaching us is this this kind of core principle that, that your life is only as strong as the friends you have at your side. Your life is only as strong as the friends that you have at your side. That if you're trying to go through life alone, if you're trying to go through life without friends or with kind of meaningful friends or maybe just a handful of of acquaintances around you for whatever reason, what the Bible is telling us is there will be things that come at you in life that, that have the potential to take you out and that you are never at your weakest point than when you are at your loneliest point. And so the, the writer says, if you have, if you have a friend, well, then you're, you're a little bit stronger. Then you can begin to defend yourselves against things that come at your way. But if you have a couple of friends, and these are like good, meaningful, authentic friendships. If you have a couple people that you can lock arms with on both sides of you, if you have some people in your life that your life and theirs are woven together in friendship, meaningful, connected friendship, then you are better able to stand strong and defend yourself against the things that come at you every single day. Because that's what friendships do. They help us not be alone in this world. They strengthen you. They support you. They sustain you through the things that come. And so the question as we jump in today is, who are those friends in your life? As you think about your own life, as think about the people that you spend time with, who are the friends that are adding strength to your life. And to kind of get a picture of what this, what this looks like, what this can look like, and the way that we can have and even be some of those friends to one another, I want to look at a story that shows up in the life and ministry of Jesus. And it shows up in Mark chapter 2. Mark is one of the gospel writers uh, who has been recounting the life of Jesus. And very early in Jesus' ministry, we find him in the small fishing village of Capernaum. Capernaum was a, just, a, like I said, a small village at the top of the Sea of Galilee. It kind of became home base for Jesus and his disciples. And so they would kind of travel and come back to Capernaum. It's believed that that's kind of where Jesus lived, where some of his disciples were, were maybe even from. And it's really early in his ministry, but he's done enough teaching and done a couple of miracles that it's got people all over the land talking. So when Jesus is back in town, someone invites them over to his house to do some, some talking of himself, to do some teaching, and to have him near, to hear what it is that he has to say. And so Mark tells us that he's gathered with some people in this house. The houses at this time probably are only like one or two rooms, very different from what we think of when we think of houses. So there's probably 30 or 40 people max, standing room only, Mark tells us, who are gathered in there listening to Jesus, but so many uh, that, that, are, that are gathered there that it actually floods out into 
the, the outer courtyard, right outside the front door, people who are just itching to get to hear Jesus. And this is when we pick up the story, when Mark tells us that some men bringing to Jesus a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. And then they lowered the mat that the man was lying on. So some guys take their paralyzed friend, they bring him to this house. They see that it's too crowded, so they go up on the roof and they lower him through the roof. Now, we're going to come back to this story in a moment, but I, I want to capture some of what's happening in this verse because I think that what these guys do, these four guys, what they do for their paralyzed friend is so remarkable. It's something, it's something that, that is so remarkable, so reckless, and, and by looking at what they do for their friend, we get to see something that we need in our friendships too. In fact, we get to see what is maybe the most important thing that we need in our side-by-side -side friendships with the people around us. And what you and I most need, what this guy on the mat, this paralyzed guy needs, what the, the friends who were carrying him, what they needed is this. We all need friends who carry us closer to Jesus. We all need friends who carry us closer to Jesus. First, first week, we talked about how all of our friendships kind of move us in certain directions in our lives. And some of our friends uh, will carry us to good places. Some of our friends may carry us to not so good places. But all of our friendships will carry us somewhere. Some of our friendships may carry our career in certain places. They may carry our, our, our status our, our self-image in certain places. We may have friends who carry us to Chiefs games because of their season tickets and they're really good friends to be with, right? All of our friendships carry us somewhere, but our best friendships, our most valuable friendships, the friendships that will pay dividends in our life and that when we get to the end of our life that we will look back on and that we will be most thankful for are the friends who carry us closer to Jesus. That's what we need. That's the strongest kind of side-by-side -side friendship that we can have. Now think about what that looked like for these four guys who were carrying their friend. Think about what it took for them to literally carry their friend closer to Jesus. It shows us that they were willing to carry their friend in his need. They were willing to carry their friend in his need. See, if you think about a paralyzed guy in, in first century Palestine. See, to, to be on a mat, it, it was quite... It was a picture of, of what your status in society was. That you were contained to your space. That you were lower than everyone else around you. And that you were really only making it because of the mercy of, of whatever people had to offer you. To be on a mat meant that you had a need. And it wasn't just a need, it was a messy need. You had a situation. And I might help you in your situation from a distance a little bit. But for the most part, that mat and whatever had you on that mat, maybe whatever got you to that mat, that was a you problem. But for these friends of this paralyzed guy, they were so unafraid of his need that they actually stepped into his need with him and carried him on his mat to be closer to Jesus. Now, that's what we need in our friendships, too, is people who will carry us in other ways closer to Jesus. And, and I know that we like, I'm going to speak for myself, but maybe this is true for a lot of you too, a lot of you who are watching online. We, we like low maintenance friendships. When things start getting a little too needy, um, and we know that boundaries are important and healthy, but sometimes when things get a little too needy, we like to step back because that just becomes a little bit too much work, right? Uh, not long ago, we had a couple of friends, uh, actually they weren't even friends, they were, they were PFPs, they were potential friend people, Okay. Hadn't quite jumped over into the friend category yet. We were just trying them out a little bit. And we had them over to the dinner. Uh, to, we had them over to our house for dinner. And uh, they, they were Chad. Chad plays keys up here. He was not up here this morning. April. April's involved in a lot of our community, initi community initiatives here at Heartland. They live close by. And so they have, we have kids the same age. So we were kind of trying this out. And um, after dinner, we were cleaning it up. And I opened up the dishwasher. And I forgot that our dishwasher had this rank stench that had been there for a long time, just hadn't gotten around to cleaning it out. Um, tried it a little bit, couldn't find it. But every time you open up the dishwasher, it just stunk up the whole kitchen. And we were gathered right there talking. And so I was just apologizing. I was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. This smells so bad. There is some sort of sour water or, or greasy, nasty, black mess. If you've ever messed with this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
And so I was just apologizing. This is, you know, embarrassing. Sorry, let's just kind of keep the dishes out of the sink and we'll just close it up. And I left the kitchen and I came back and I, and I see April down on her knees, half her body deep in the back of my dishwasher. If you know April, this is very April, okay? Um, she, she had taken apart the dishwasher and she was, had a towel and she was wiping the inside of my dishwasher, y'all, looking for whatever this mess might be in order to clean out my dishwasher. And I'm even more embarrassed right now. I'm like, what do you think you're doing? No, 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 you don't have to do this. This is, this is our mess. We don't, we don't need you to, to be in our mess. But we do. You know, it might not be a dishwasher mess, but maybe there's some messes and some needs and some situations in your life that maybe you're a little hesitant to let people step into. But when we do, when we let people step into our mess, then it actually allows them to help carry us closer to Jesus. Maybe what are some of the messes in your life? And are you willing to let people step into that mess? Are you willing to let people see what that mess is. The Bible has a word for these kinds of needs in our life. They're called burdens. And in fact, later in the New Testament, Paul, who was kind of one of the first pastors of churches after Jesus, uh, he writes a letter to churches and he, and he talks to them about these needs that show up. And he says to them this, he says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. That when there are things that are too heavy for your friends to be carrying on their back, then our job as friends, interesting that he's writing to a bunch of people in the church that we can actually be friends with one another. He says, our job is to carry, to transfer the weight from that person's shoulders to your own, to take, what, to take what's weighing them down that's in their pack, in their life, and to put it into your own pack for a season. And, and, and those are the burdens that we have. Sometimes the burdens that we have are the things that we, that we most don't want people to see because then it lets them know that we have a need in our life that maybe we're a, a little embarrassed about, something that we haven't taken care of, Thinking, think, something that suggests maybe we aren't as strong or, or successful or as put together as we want them to think we are. But when we actually carry one another's burdens, Paul tells us, he says, then you will fulfill the law of Christ. That in the ministry of Jesus, that someone comes up to him and says, hey, hey, what's the most important law? Of all 600 some odd laws that are in the Old Testament, ways that we should live, what's the most important one? And Jesus takes all 600, he boils it down to two, and he, really, he says really the essence of those two is this, is to love one another the way that God has loved you. Paul is saying that when we carry one another's burdens, when we're so unafraid of one another's needs that we're willing to step into that with one another, that we're actually fulfilling the law of Christ. That we're doing the most important thing that Jesus tells us to do. That's what these four friends were willing to do for their paralyzed friend. It's what we should be willing to do for one another in our own friendships. It's what we need people to do for us. They were willing to carry their friend in his need, but they were also willing to do something else. These four friends were willing to carry their friend through the obstacles to Jesus. They were willing to carry their friend through the obstacles to Jesus. Now, when they show up on the scene, you know, they they hear that Jesus is in town. Jesus has been rumored to do some pretty powerful and miraculous things. They're not quite sure necessarily who Jesus is. But they go immediately, they go and find their paralyzed friend wherever he's hanging out. And they take him and they carry him. They probably run with him to go find where Jesus is. They get to this crowded house. And what they don't do is they don't say, oh, it's too crowded. We're kind of late to the party, so let's just go home. What they don't do is they say, hey, um, let's see if Jesus will come outside. They don't say, hey, let's just wait here until Jesus is done and we'll catch him on his way out. Now, all of those things would be easy and would be reasonable. But good friends, you know this, good friends don't care about what's easy and reasonable. They also don't care about a little property damage, (laughs) which is what these guys were willing to do because they saw that there was an obstacle in front of their friend who was in need. And so they were willing to carry their friend through the obstacle. And so they, they take this guy and it's one thing to carry someone. If you've done that, you know that that's hard and that's awkward, but to climb with someone, especially if you're the someone who's being carried, 
that's a lot of trust and vulnerability that you're not going to be dropped as they're climbing up on top of this house. Now, houses in first century, uh, they, were, they were kind of built with some trusses over these rooms, and, and they'd be made out of large tree branches, and then over those branches would be spread mud and dirt and clay and, and rocks, and that was strong enough that these guys could get up on the roof, and it would sustain all five of their, their weight. And so they get up there. It was strong enough to do that, but they didn't have a crowbar. They didn't have a shovel. Digging through the roof wasn't part of the plan. So they probably grab a rock or a stick or their own hands and they start kind of like my retriever in my backyard, just kind of going to town on the, on the, on the roof that's be, be below them. Now, if right here, right now, you start feeling a little dust fall on your head and shoulders and you like look up and above those bright lights, you see a little bit of light peek through that dark ceiling and some metal start to peel back and then all of a sudden pieces of the roof start falling around you, you might be a little concerned. You might be a little confused. If this was your house, you might be a little upset, right? There was no insurance adjuster to come out and fix this for you. No. But if you were the friend who was being lowered on the mat through the hole in the roof, you'd be pretty thankful because you had some fellas who were willing to dig through the roof to get you closer to Jesus, who were willing to take the obstacles that were between you and Jesus and who were willing to help you do whatever it took to get through those obstacles. Because that's what we all need in our life. Because there are no shortage of obstacles (laughs) between you and the love of Jesus, is there? There is nothing that is, there are so many things, there are so many things that, are, that, that could be in your life keeping you from getting to Jesus. If you're someone who's been walking with Jesus for a while, this is still true. There may be some busyness that's keeping you from Jesus. That's an obstacle. There may be some, some comfort or some apathy. There may be some pride that's keeping you from Jesus. If you're newer to church, if you're exploring who Jesus is, then there's most certainly definitely some obstacles that may be getting in the way, that maybe you've heard something about God along the way that has created an obstacle to you and Jesus, that maybe you had an experience with God or church or people who said that they follow Jesus and that has created an obstacle between you and Jesus. This is, this is one of the things that I so love about this church, that even before getting to call myself a pastor of Heartland, what I knew about Heartland since day one is that Heartland wanted to be a church that would carry people through obstacles, not create them. That would break down the obstacles between people, especially those who are furthest from the love of God, because we all have people in our lives who are close to us, but who are far from God. And that Heartland would be a place that would break down those obstacles rather than build them because there's no shortage of obstacles in our world between people and the love of God. This is why I love Bill and Earl. Half of you walked past Bill and Earl this morning if you came through this set of doors over here. And Julie right out here. And our hospitality team, our volunteers who show up early. And what they're doing is literally holding open the doors to help us get closer to Jesus. Then they're not standing in front of the doors. Those are bouncers. (laughs) And yet we've been to churches where it feels like there's kind of a bouncer mentality sometimes. And maybe in our weaker moments, we might have experienced that here at Harland, or, or we have definitely have the ability to, but we're so committed to breaking down the obstacles by holding open the doors that right now, you're sitting in a chair. If you're here in the, in the auditorium right now, you're sitting in a chair that has been prayed for by someone this morning. And what they were praying without even knowing your name was that whoever sat in that chair would have an obstacle removed between them and the love of God. That you could walk out of here this morning a little bit closer to the love of God in your life. Because we make obstacles, we risk making obstacles, especially as a church, when we make it about ourselves and not other people, we make it about maybe our opinions or preferences, when we make it about uh, rules, when we make it about what our political opinions are, that there's no shortage of things that we can do or say or ways that we can relate to one another that, that can risk creating obstacles between people and the love of the God, which is why we have to hold so tightly to be a church that's going to remove obstacles, that's going to carry people through the obstacles rather than create obstacles for people. Because we do have something that's between us and the love of God. And it's a pretty big obstacle. It's this one right here. 
It's sin. We don't like talking about sin. In fact, even saying it, I feel like the church lady on Saturday Night Live. Like, like it, 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 that's a word that you expect to hear in church. That's a pretty big obstacle. So just to make sure we know what we're talking about when we're talking about sin, we're talking about anything in our life that we put in the way of Jesus. How would your understanding of sin change if you thought about it like this? That it was something that was getting in the way between you and Jesus. Lots of times, uh, Dan and I, especially this summer, for some of you who've been newer to Heartland, we get to hear some questions, some feedback, get to share with you who Heartland is. And sometimes it's very different than churches that you may have gone to in the past. And one of the things we hear from time to time is, hey, why do you guys spend so much time talking about how God loves everybody? And why don't we spend more time talking about how everybody's a sinner? And it's a good question. Here's why. Because God loves everybody. God loves everybody so much that he sent Jesus so that there would be nothing that would get in the way of that love. Because what is abundant around our world and in our lives is sin. That there is no shortage of things that are getting in the way of our experience, our relationship, our eternity with Jesus. And so, yes, we need to hold tightly to that message of of how much God loves us and welcomes us no matter what the junk and the mess is that is in our life. But as part of that love, he also reminds us that there is stuff that shouldn't be there that's getting in the way of our experience of his love. How we talk about that matters. How we deal with this in our friendships with one another matters because sin can be an obstacle to your experience of the love and the power of God. And so in Galatians, there's another verse right before this one that says, brothers and sisters, saying, friends, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Now, what Paul is saying here, what he's not saying, is that we should send out the sin search parties to go find people, to go find you and me in the midst of our sin and call them out on it. No, that's not what Paul's telling us to do. He's saying if someone is caught in sin, if something is is getting in the way of their ability to live life and experience the love of God to the fullest, then you who live by the Spirit. Now, who's that? That's a good question. Elsewhere in in Galatians, Paul actually earlier, he, he just said that those who live by the Spirit, who have the fruit of the Spirit in their life, he says, the evidence of the Spirit that's abundant for all to see and to taste and experience in their life are those who are loving of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. If you live by the Spirit, then you should restore that person gently, without a hint of judgment or self-righteousness or hypocrisy. You know who's the best at restoring sinners gently? sinners. This is something we learn from AA and NA, that we need to sit in circles of trusted relationships with people who have experienced what we've experienced, who know that we're no better than the person next to us, that we're standing on the same equal level ground. That, that we need people in our lives who are willing to carry us, that there is no better place for us then into the forgiveness of Jesus, to carry us into the mercy and the power and the freedom of Jesus because they know that there's no better place for them to be there too and that they're standing on the ground next to us as we experience that forgiveness of Jesus together. So when's the last time that maybe you reached out to a friend and said, hey, there's something in my life that I've been trying to deal with alone. And it's been a struggle. And I haven't been willing to talk about it, or maybe I have, but I just haven't really dealt with it. And and I can't do it alone. And and would you just help me with this? Would you just know about this? Would you just pray with me about this? And if you're a person who has the privilege of receiving that text or that request from someone, that's an honor that you get to carry that person into the love and the power, into the forgiveness of Jesus. Jesus. Here's the other thing that these guys do for their paralyzed friend. They carry him with their faith. They carry him with their faith. We all need people in our lives whose, whose faith can carry us through season. When our, when our faith is low, that we can dip into and borrow the faith 
that they have. That these guys, they, they heard, they had just enough faith to know that this guy that was back in town that had apparently done some pretty miraculous things might be willing and able to help their friend. And so they go and they get him and they bring him back to Jesus. And, and here's how, here's how uh, Mark tells the rest of the story. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, other people were looking at the roof. But Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And not everyone liked that who was there listening to Jesus. And so Mark tells us, he says, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. So he got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Now, as Mark is writing this scene for us, what he's doing, and especially these first few chapters of this gospel, is he's building up a case for us of of who he wants us to see that Jesus is. That Jesus wasn't just a, a nobody, or he wasn't even just a somebody. He was, in fact, God. Now, if you, if you were the guy, the paralyzed guy, who was lowered through the roof on a mat, who went through all of that, and you get before Jesus, and Jesus says to you, hey, good news, your sins are forgiven. I'd be like, thanks? See the rest of me? That's why we're here. I don't even know if that forgiveness thing is doing me much good. I'm just gonna take your word for that. But what about the rest of me? That's why I'm here. That's why they carried me this whole distance. But see, Jesus always sees the needs in us that we don't know we have. Jesus always sees the ways that we're paralyzed spiritually, which is what sin does. He doesn't just see the ways that we're paralyzed physically. And he's always willing to meet our greatest needs first, even if it's not the most urgent for us. But he knew what everyone was thinking. And they knew that he couldn't say that, definitely couldn't do that if he wasn't God. So Jesus does this paralyzed guy a solid. He says, I'll tell you what, just so everyone here knows that what I said, I can actually do, get up, take your mat and walk. And because of that, everyone was amazed. Now, that's what Mark wants us to see is that Jesus could only do that if he was in fact God. But what we can't miss in this story is that none of that would have happened if four friends hadn't had the faith to take their friend and do whatever it took to carry him closer to Jesus. And because they did, the people were amazed and saying, we have never seen anything like this. That what they did in their friend's life set off a sequence of events that allowed people to know that this fella that they had heard a rumor about was in fact the God who came on earth so that everyone would know that they were loved far greater than they thought they were. Because our friendships with one another, our side-by-side people that we lock arms with, that we carry one another closer to Jesus, not only does that do good things in our own life, but it also puts on display to all of those people around us who God is. That's what we're doing, Harland. That's what we need to be doing. Not only for you and for me, but for the people in your life who don't know the love of God. Because your friendships actually have the power to help them see who Jesus is. So where do we go from here? How do we get practical with this? I want you to think about the friendships in your life, right? Maybe this week, spend some time, get a notepad on your phone. When you have a minute, just just write out some of the friends who come to the top of your mind. And every single friendship that we have in our life, it's gonna fall in, in one of three different categories. If you think about this triangle as the friendships in your life, some of your friends 
will be in this category down here. A lot of them. These are, this is what we call happenstance friends. These are the friends that we happen to be friends with. That because we're neighbors, because we're coworkers, because our kids happen to be on the same team together, because we're at the pool around the same time on the weekends, we happen to be friends with them. But if that ever changed, we might not be friends with them anymore. It was good while it lasted. But maybe there's some people in your life that fall into this category. These are intentional friends. These are the people that even if you did move, even if your schedule or your job did change, you would make it a point, you do make it a point to stay in touch with them. You send them that text. You, I got a text like this from a friend. He was an intentional friend. I don't even know if I knew it, but he said, hey, I've got lunch free. You want to meet up? And because of that greater intentionality, those friendships mean something more and have greater impact in your life. We need those people. There's a third category that we often miss. And it's this top one, what I'm gonna call Jesus first friends. These are the people in your life and in mine that carry us closer to Jesus. And I'm borrowing language from our mission statement, our heartbeat as a church, that we make space because we have crowded lives and live in a crowded and busy world, so we make space to build relationships, to build deep connections with one another, friendships even, to make Jesus first. Because we're convinced that God does his best work in our lives, that he can become more and more important through those relationships, that Jesus can become first. And so these are the people who carry us closer to Jesus. They carry us through our need. They carry us through the obstacles. They see them even before we do. They carry us in faith. But these don't just happen. It's not just because you happen to be friends or you happen to go to the same church or you even happen to be in the same community or small group or Bible study. That doesn't mean that these are Jesus' first friendships. We have to ask. We have to be willing to say yes. We have to be willing to realize that we need these people in our lives. And so that's why this is such a strategic time of the year for us, Heartland. It's why we have our atrium filled with signs around the wall. And maybe right off the bat, you're not gonna find a Jesus first friend. I mean, if you want, go out and say, hey, will you be my Jesus first friend? You never know. But it might take some time. That's why we have midweek starting up, is to, is to help you level up some of these friendships. But that's my question for you today. Is if you look at your friends and you think about what kind of friends they are, who can you level up in this season? And maybe it's a happenstance friend that you say, you know what, I want them to be an intentional friend. They're their potential friend material, and I'm going to take that step. Or maybe it's someone that you can say, hey, can you make Jesus a bigger part of my life through a friendship with you? A few weeks after Chad and April had dinner at our house, I got a text from Chad. And it was to me and it was to a couple other guys from here at Heartland. I said, hey, fellas, I think we all know one another. I think we kind of like hanging out together. What I know is that we all want Jesus to be a big part of our life. And I know that we can't do it alone. So what if we did this together? Said, I also know we like donuts. So how about Monday mornings? We grab a donut, talk about life, and we encourage what Jesus is doing in each of our lives. And because Chad took that step, I had a couple more Jesus first friendships going on in my life. And that doesn't mean it wasn't without its ebbs and flows. And right now we're trying to figure out how do we get back on that? because we know that we need it. We know that it's going to take sacrifice. We know that we've got to be purposeful in that short time that we get together before we get home to get our kids to where they need to go. But when we have people who are willing to carry us closer to Jesus, it makes our life, it makes our experience of God so much better. So let me pray for us. Let's stand and just pray that God will be at work in our lives. Pray for all of you who are watching at home. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God who loves us so much that you see us in our need, you see us in our loneliness. And I pray, God, that you would raise up the friends around us that we most need, that you would raise up people in our lives who would carry us closer to Jesus, who would be unafraid of the messes and the needs of our life, and that we would be unafraid to put that out there, risking whatever that might mean. People who would be willing to carry us through the obstacles that get in the way of your love and your power and your purpose in our life, God, willing to carry us with their faith when our faith is all dried up. And Lord, help us to be those friends to one another. That our life would be stronger because of the people that we're choosing to lock arms with. And God, I pray for Heartland. 
Lord, I pray for this church that we would continue to be a place that busts through the obstacles that get in the way of our world and the love of Jesus. I saw it yesterday watching so many volunteers putting bags of food in people's cars, God, so not only so they could be fed, but so they could experience the love of Jesus. We saw it on Wednesday night with the students who were gathered having fun, getting soaked in the water, God, building friendships because we want them to have friendships with people who would carry them closer to Jesus. Lord, that's what we need. And so in our services and our ministries and our things that are coming up this fall, we know we're gonna learn great things, but would we all experience great friendships along the way too? Jesus, it's in your name and in your power that we pray, be in our conversations out in the atrium. Help us to have a fun and amazing week. In your name we pray, amen.